All right, we got a jam-packed episode coming up for you. In spite of a difficult loss on the road to the Golden State Warriors, we start off with the epic performance, the elite talent that is one Kyrie Irving, and how unfortunately it got wasted in this game. We'll take a look at some of the roster, the rotations, the injury updates, but then there's a nice little beefy chunk in the center, Doug, where you go ahead and get after Steve Nash. Shoveled a bunch of snow and got ticked off at no challenges. So that was the kind of the story of my uh, my Saturday and Sunday. We're going to get into it all. But first, the theme music. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up? It's the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day over there. That's Doug Norrie. You can find him on Twitter, fresh, checkmark. Also, owner-operator DFSR for all your daily fantasy sports projections and rankings. DraftKings FanDuel, he's got you covered. I'm Adam Armbrecht covering the big offseason for the New York Football Giants on the One Giant Podcast. We come in on a Monday, sir, to talk about the game on Saturday night between the Warriors and the Brooklyn Nets, but... Uh, just real quick here. You love yourself a nice little bit of fresh powder, don't you, sir? Oh, snow? It's the worst. My God. Oh. Like, who wants this? Way. Who signs up for this? This is my first winter that I've done on the East Coast for like five years. And I'm just like, what was I thinking? Out there just humping snow back and forth to one place to another, backbreaking work. I don't know, who, who signs up for this? I don't know why I did. I feel like I was in crazy town for moving back to this, but hey, that's what Love you're going to get. Every second of it, I think, as, as I said to you on Twitter, every snowflake's a little <laughs> miracle. Just enjoy them, soak them up, maybe even save some, put them in your freezer and look at them later on. We're going to get into the game here, late game sequences, some maybe questionable coaching decisions on Steve Nash's part, and then the roster overall, role players, and then injuries, what this road looks like as the trade deadline looms, and whether or not some of these games impact how the Brooklyn Nets approach that. But first and foremost, it was a tight loss on the road, as I said, to the Golden State Warriors for the Brooklyn Nets, 110-106. But inside of that, man, a little bit of Kyrie Irving action. This is where, <laughs> we said this before, you know, absence should make the heart grow fonder. But in sports, it feels like absence makes you forget how good a player is. No. Because this is a game that was getting away from the Nets down at one point, basically 2019, flexed around there. And in the second half of this one, third quarter specifically, Kyrie Irving just starts to take over to really lift this team and make this a basketball game in the fourth. Yeah, look, I'm happy to start with the positives here because I think there's plenty of things that weren't positive, which I know we're going to get to. Um, but yeah, like I don't know how you look at this game and don't feel conflicting things. One is <laughs> like the joy to be able to watch this guy play. It's just you can't really overstate it. Like, and we've been at this for a couple of years now, basically ever. I mean, really ever since in the league. But when he's on your team, you tend to notice it more and more because you watch it every single night and every single play that he's actually on the court. And when he's out there, he's just a total master. And the fact that he's at this level, eight games in with no ramp up, like no preseason, very little practice. You know, none of the other stuff that's been going on. Yeah, you want to say he has some fresh legs? Okay. Um, maybe that helps. He did look a little gassed at the end of this one, but right. man, from a talent perspective, I, there's very few players that are just even close to like his abilities, especially on ball. And so you get into this conflicting piece where it's like, yeah, it's amazing when you get to watch it. And then you just get pissed off <laughs> that, that you've been able to watch it so little since he signed on here in Brooklyn for a variety of reasons. Obviously the most recent one, the vaccine set stuff. So, Look, this game was like most of all, most everything you want in a basketball game. And it really, even though the Nets lost, it sucks. But it starts with you just get guys at, like that are just masters at their craft. And he's just clearly one of them. And this game was just another example of it. This is where and it was 655 mark. He knocks down a triple and that put him at 16 points. So essentially the 12 points they scored in the quarter. He also did that over the course of, of six minutes, basically. Right. So it wasn't he didn't even take the whole quarter to accomplish it. To your point, it, it's awesome to watch him. I think that we said this before about when you only have one of these stars on the court and nets or otherwise, and you see a really big performance, it should be elevated even more because you realize that defensively, 
that's the guy. That's your number one concern. The fact that Kyrie is still able to find ways to create space for himself, to get shots, to put up shots, even when he didn't have any space at all. It was really impressive. And I'll leave it. I'll remember the, the switch out on the right side when he has Kaminga defending against him. And essentially, this is like what you do if you were programming a video game and you want to have like the trick sequence. Kyrie Irving is dribbling the ball centimeters off the court, backing down Kaminga and then rising up for a mid-range, a mid-range knockdown that was really impressive. But it, it, he seems like he's in vintage form. To your point, the fat- fatigue factor does seem to be setting in here a little bit and and it gets a little bit of the excitement sucked out of it because more often than not now, these big performances for Kyrie, for Harden, even for Kevin Durant are often coming in losing efforts. Yeah. Like, I don't know what to do here. I, this is, this is why I mean it's conflicting because uh, like on the one hand, the, the whole key of the net season here is just getting healthy. And so, um, that's just a, a drum. We're just going to beat from now till probably the end of the season and into the playoffs. If they're healthy, there's just, they're easily the best team of basketball and it's just not close. The problem yeah. is they just can't seem to get there. Um, more stuff with Harden. We'll get to that more stuff with Aldridge is hurt now. And obviously the stuff with Harrison and KD already. Um, because like, look, when you have a guy like this, the Kaminga play the ball, he actually lost the handle a little bit, but he, you don't, you don't even notice it because as he's it doing like a globe trotter move on <laughs> <laughs> with his left hand and then switches it over. Um, like you just don't even realize. And, and all, and two, to, you know, in terms of what Golden State was sort of throwing at. Now they're missing their best defender, so okay, right. Dray- Draymond's not there. But they clearly had a plan, which was to trap him high as much as po- trap him, blitz him as much as high as much as they could, high as possible, which really did cause him some problems, uh, which is going to cause most anybody problems. Like they tried and they tried to get out of it a ton. He's like not big enough to pass over a lot of these, so like that's always going to be a little bit of a problem for him because he's just so small, uh, just comparatively. That you know when he gets trapped, there's. Few, there's very few ways for him to get out of it, right? He, Unlike he's Kevin like, Durant when you run the blitz and he goes, well, like Luca or guys like this. Right, right, like if you try, right. you know, if you try to send doubles at them, they're like, cool, I'm 6'11". Like I'll just pass <laughs> over you. Um, like there's very few guys. Like he's just not like that. But there were times where he split, like he split the the blitz and like the pick and roll up a couple times, like masterfully. And just the finishing stuff around the rim, it's just all superlatives around his game. And I'm with you. When you have a game like this and you lose – it does make it a, that much tougher because when you turn in masterful performances from your best players, it just feels inside like you should win those games. And when you don't, yeah, I'm with you. It stings a little bit more. So I don't know. This is why I mean I'm conflicted. This is why I'm of two minds here because I'm on the one hand, I love watching it. There's really honestly almost nobody in the NBA better to watch. And it's not just saying that because he's on the nets. And at the same time, you don't get him enough. And you lose the game. And so I'm actually glad we took like 24 hours before we potted about this one because I was actually kind of emotional after this, after this <laughs> loss. Not like in a crying way, but like in a, well, like, just, like, in a like a fired up slash deflated way almost. And it was and a lot of it was because of how great Kyrie was and and, and how the game ended up finishing off. Hardest part for Doug was shoveling snow that he was actively crying into. That was a really difficult sequence. It made for me to feel go better. Through, but... I worked it off, sweated it off. You know. Well, so by was... the way, though, you say like again, the positive of watching the game and the double down of this is. So what happened? Now they get a couple of days off before they play on Tuesday night. But what does it look like now if you get a an off game from Kyrie? Right now, it feels like that makes it even worse too because you waste that effort in a big one coming into this game. We're gonna get the injuries later. I think just specifically this third quarter because we'll talk about a lot of the other role players, but I think it's just worth mentioning on the tail end of this that inside of that third quarter, it was a great job, obviously, by Kyrie leading the way. LaMarcus Aldridge was able to feed off of what he was doing effectively and creating some space for himself in and around the basket. And the last, I'll, I'll give the tip of the cap here because he's been he's been dragged a lot, and Bruce Brown did a really good job, I thought, in that third quarter, helping Kyrie find a little bit of space because inside of this game, when you don't have Harden, you're looking for defensive rebounds. Bruce Brown was doing that, and when he was being the trigger man bringing the ball up the court, he was able to effectively work to work to the spot on the right side of top of the key and then do a little drop-off pass to Kyrie, which seemed to allow Kyrie to, to get into a flow and a rhythm with his shot. So it, it, that, that was the, the jump-off point of what led into, I thought, a very – team oriented fourth quarter as big as this quarter was for Kyrie you said it he got tired started to see some fatigue somebody else had to step up we'll, we'll get into some of that after we break down what if you, th- if you thought Doug was hot right after the game I think he'll still find a way to get there for you before we do though tell everybody about uh Bill Barr 
<laughs> All right, New Year's resolutions. I got a couple of them. One is to stay calmer in the moment. The other one is to get fit, uh, start eating right, just getting healthier options around snacking and stuff. We've been talking to you about Bilt Bar forever now. That's because Bilt Bar just makes it easy. It makes it easy to keep the protein levels high while also just tasting something that tastes delicious in a way that most protein bars, or really all protein bars, except for Bilt Bar, have not figured out up until this point. That's because Bilt Bar started with the flavors, raspberry, cookies and cream, salted caramel, mint brownie, coconut almond. That's just a smattering of the flavors that Bilt Bar is throwing your way. That's because they made that a priority. They covered it with 100% in chocolate. So you're thinking, okay, all those flavors covered in chocolate, no chance it's healthy. Get to the analytics, folks. 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, 17 grams of protein. Throw it. Throw that up next to a candy bar. It just buries a candy bar. It's a candy bar, 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar. I can't even read these numbers. Disgusting to look at. Built Bar has you covered for staying healthy in the new year. Go to built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15. You'll get 15% off of your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. And, of course, you make us the Locked On Nets podcast your first listen of the day. Why don't you make the NBA trade trade deadline, which is looming Thursday, February 10th at 3 p.m., Locked On NBA. That's the second listen you're going to want to have because they'll be podcasting with live coverage from 2 to 4 p.m. It's going to be Kim Becker, John Carolis, Locked On Fantasy Basketball host Josh Lloyd breaking down all the trades as well as bringing in some of the local experts like Doug Norrie or myself potentially. If the if the Giants, <laughs> if the Nets were to make a move, you got to be locked in for it. So be sure to check that out. Running it all live over there. We turn our attention then to uh, what was the fourth quarter. By the way, the Nets, after being down as much as they were, they were down by two entering the fourth quarter and very quickly gave themselves a lead on uh, after a couple of triples exchanged back and forth there. But we focus on the end, Doug, because that's really where this all begins to fall apart for Brooklyn. The 144 mark, I think, is where is where we start this. Steph Curry, Golden State, on the offensive end, works to the left side of the arc. It has Kessler Edwards defending against him and effectively gets a foul call on the move that the NBA has worked to eradicate, the, the lean in on your shot. Gets called a foul. It's right there in front of the Nets bench. It's right there in front of Steve Nash. And then what happens, Doug? Well, I freaked out is what happens. Nothing, nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's what, yeah, nothing well, I just happens. Lost, my, lost my absolute mind sitting on the couch. So Steph thinks if you're watching the game or if you didn't, it's this is pretty easy to just picture but either way. Steph thinks he's going to get fouled. Kessler Edwards, who's played unreal defense in this game. Like yes. he his def, like absolute A-plus defense, really tough defensive assignments, and he was up to the task for almost all of them. Like he was easily the Nets' best defender. He's isolated on the wing with Steph, which is where you never want to be as, as a defender because he's just usually going to – he can break it down in a couple different ways. Steph goes up. Steph thinks he's going to get fouled as he goes up. Doesn't get fouled because Kessler actually, like, moves the close out a little bit past him. And Curry does, like you said, like, just clearly jumps into him. And is so, Curry's so confused. And this is actually – this is where it really is, like, so obvious what happened. Curry is so confused about not getting fouled that he actually passes – because this ended up being right. a shooting foul, but he and they were in the boat, they were in the penalty at this point that he actually passes to I think like Wiggins standing in the corner. It's like so obvious that this was not a foul. I do not, I have no, and they have timeouts left. How do you not challenge it? This is such a critical point of the game. It's about to be a jump ball between because they're going to win the challenge. Like there's just no way they can't. You cannot, as a referee, look at this and say Steph did not throw his body into, into Gessler Edwards. It's like, right. It's unassailable. I, I don't like no. So and it's at such. It's not even that. So I can like I can look if this is the first quarter. Like whatever the game. There's game to go. I, I'm still usually for challenging stuff if it's wrong because it all kind of matters in the aggregate. Yep, yep. But like, and I'm still on team. It probably matters a little little bit more now. <laughs> like in the uh, like from a leverage point of view, because the difference of sending a guy who's just going to make two free throws in Steph, like the very best free throw shooter in the, in the world, probably, or just about the difference of like having a 50, 50 ball on a win on a w one challenge down three or, or just being guaranteed to be down by five, which is what you do guarantee you by sending stuff to the line. You have to just try, you have to try, you have enough time. Like you see it on the board. Like you have people that are there to tell you this. Like I don't, I'll never understand it. Now I'm, this was, I get, we'll get to the end point sequence, which I was also pissed off that they didn't review that one. That was only accentuated by how egregious this one was for not reviewing this, like, and not challenging this play. It's such a, 
it's actually a miracle that at this point they're down five that they actually even made it a game because at this point with like 144 down five against a team like Golden State, you're like, oh now but now we're really pretty in trouble here. Yeah. Um, I just like, are you with me on this? Like I, 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 I couldn't tell if I was just overreacting in the moment. I lost it, like lost it in a way. Like I, my daughter was watching with me and she's trying to understand the game and I appreciate that and whatever. And I was just like, what are they doing? And now she's like, what are you mad about? I was like, guys, I don't know. I'm just mad. I can't explain it. <laughs> well, and here, here's the problem is, is because again, 144. So you can look at, you can look at the time left on the clock, the score and know like effectively, this, uh, to your point, the fact that there end up being more sequences here and the Nets had some opportunities maybe to still pull this game out, you cannot go in with that assumption when you have Steph Curry and Klay Thompson and these guys that you're playing against. So it effectively feels like the game hangs in the balance on this call. The other piece of it is, too, I, I, I don't, uh, there's, uh, there's, no, there's no defense of it. You have to challenge this call a thousand times out of a thousand. Specifically, you hear the broadcasters, they're all saying this is the exact play that the NBA and the referees have been trying to get out of the game. Now, whether or not, this is, I'm not even going to leave the seed match out of it. Whether or not the fact that it's Kessler Edwards and it's Steph Curry plays a role in this, i.e. reverse these and have it be Steph Curry defending Kessler Edwards, there's no way that Kessler Edwards gets this foul call, right? It automatically is going to be either a no call or maybe they're actually going to call Kessler for the offensive lean in and go the other way with it. I don't know if that plays any role into any coach, let alone Steve Nash about, man, like we know how these sequences go, star driven league, blah, blah, blah. Everything about this, including the fact that that's Patty Mills too much did, credit. Sorry, I, no, 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 no. That's, what I'm yeah. saying, that's what I'm saying. Everything about this, including Patty Mills, who seemingly I thought made the review gesture before Steph Curry made uh, made his first free throw attempt to say to Steve Nash, "Hey, you need to do it." Everything about this, it's right in front of Steve Nash. He watches the entire play happen, watch the entire sequence play itself out. It's a critical moment. This is one of those ones where even if you didn't think it was going to get reversed, if it wasn't such an egregious foul or missed foul call, you would say it's still worth it from an emotional standpoint. Kessler Edwards is playing his butt off this entire game. Reward him by sticking up for him in this moment. And I 100% agree with you. It, it, it is about as egregious as it can be in terms of, of an error that we've talked about. Steve Nash, people have dogged him for rotations and other things. It's it, you can you can debate that kind of stuff about what makes sense. This is about as clear cut as you can be. Of look at the time of the game, look at the defender, look at the play, challenge it, and live with the results. By the way, because guess what? Look who's going, going to, to the good. line. Look who's right. Look who's going to the line. Steph Curry is like I'm, I'll look it up real quick. He's like a ninety percent free throw shooter. He's just right. gonna make them. Like he's yeah. just gonna. It's just an automatic two points. Like this is the part where like I was. That's why I was gonna take it the other way on like if it's Kessler Edwards versus Curry. The fact that it's Curry is the reason I definitely try. Right. He's just a he's a ninety one percent free throw through shooter. He's for his career. <laughs> right. Like right. so like, likewise, like, if if it's Kevin Durant, if it's Kyrie Irving, right, you go, you know what? Let's challenge it because this is about as assumed two points as you could possibly have. Yeah, like it's Gary Payton Jr. and he's like, I don't know, like a 60 foot, whatever he is, like 65, 70% free throw shooter. You're like, okay, maybe. Right. Like if it's just the very best shoot, like free throw shooter, like almost in the history of the game, just going up there, like you have to try. It's just such a leverage moment. So it just really, like, I'm really going to go crazy about one moment. but And and I really do think like the, the end piece, I, and I'm going to, we'll fly through this real quick. At the end of the game, Curry, sorry, not Curry, uh, on the inbound when they're down one, where, the, uh, where they just hit the miracle three, and like, you know, Kyrie's hit the big three to bring them into one. Now they can foul and they're still kind of in it. And there's inbound play and Clay falls over and um, with Kyrie on them. And they don't challenge that one either. I, I can see not challenging that one. And staff, ha staff geez, I'm all over the place now. Nash had a post-game conference where he said a little birdie told me that um, it wasn't going to get overturned. And he's referring there to the referees making a comment like it was definitely a foul. In watching that one. I agree that it's probably not going to be overturned. That being said, the reason you probably still at least try at this point, because if you don't try, the game is also just over. <laughs> because well, like right. Clay knocks down if like Clay knocks down the free throw, I guess you're hoping he misses one of the next three free throws or whatever. Like that's the only hope you have. Because the second, again, you're about to put like 90% three free throw shooters on the line. So what's the expectation there? Like 2.75 points or something like that? Like you're almost definitely going to lose anyway. So that, that one's not as egregious, but it was really highlighted by missing the first one as far as I was concerned. Yeah, in between these sequences, a great block on Curry by Kessler Edwards, almost accentuating his value over the course of this game. But to your point, the only thing I'll say is on that one, the second one is I get your point of like, you can't take these things with him. You might as well throw out the challenge. I, I don't mind using it as a, hey, let's all take a deep breath here. You know, use it as a pseudo timeout. And what can we go over before we get into these sequences? And also... Once you once they review the rest reviewed that on their own and said yeah it's a foul here's the call uh, yeah. there's just no world where you go 
Now challenge that. Go look at it a second time now and tell me yep. that. And maybe just be the... It's like almost... I, I'll, I'll put it this way. Maybe Steve Nash was going to do it just for the sake of it, to your point, Clay Thompson on the line. And maybe it's the fact that he had just not done it in the previous sequence, and he knows he's going to get this one wrong, and it's going to look that much worse if you go, so you didn't use the challenge on what felt like as clear of a, of a call you're going to get overturned, but then you throw it out here when it seems like there's no world you're going to get this one back. Yeah, look, I'm totally admitting that my vision on this is clouded by the earlier thing. Like, right. so I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with that. In a vacuum, I, I probably agree that you don't review this one. It was just that the other, I was still so steamed from the one before <laughs> that oh, yeah. uh, I just, by I the just way, thought this that is where you want Steve Nash. We're going to get into injury updates, the roster, and maybe, you know, what could need to happen here and what the takeaways you can have from this game in the big picture. But by the way, this is where Steve Nash, you should be getting teed up. You should be getting teed up arguing about it, not being a foul on Kyrie tripping Clay Thompson. And then also screaming about the other one that you forgot to challenge. Yeah. Like at some point, some level of emotion needs to get shown here, but as it stands, um, we would pick it up and maybe this is just, this is obviously a red mark on the ledger for Steve Nash. Now though, that we've lost the game and Steve Nash <laughs> bungled it <laughs> and things are terrible. And, and I make one more point. Cause I think we're going to sure. move on to some injury stuff. I, I'll, yeah. I Cause we kind of just did pass through these two things. Um, we did go past just right past where Patty Mills was like just played absolutely out of his mind also in this game. And we don't need to take too much time on this because now I think we're just getting used to Patty Mills just hitting huge yeah. shot after huge shot after huge shot, six or 12 from three. Uh, we're not going to take 10 minutes talking about Patty Mills. I will say one thing about him, him, him here, though, is that one thing you love to see is that like we already know that the stage is not too big for him. Like there's no stage too big for him. And this is where if and when the Nets make a deep playoff run, like he's already a guy you feel very, very good about um, taking like really high quality leverage minutes in playoff series because his ability to just hit big shots, <laughs> frankly, is like the reason that Nets fans can't stand Joe Harris because like Harris has not done this kind of thing in the playoffs so far and hate to just drag Harris. Harris is like, hey, what did I even, I didn't even play the game. Why God, am I I'm not even here? on the court, Jesus. <laughs> I had a step back of my injury. Like, what are you doing? Anyways, I didn't want to like go through this whole um where we talked about Kessler and we talked about Bruce Brown and we talked about Kyrie and all these guys. Um, and not mention that like the other biggest reason they were in this game was because Patty Mills just refused to miss um at the at the times where they just needed him to make all the shots. So anyway, we can move on now. But I just wanted to I didn't want to just roll past him and be like, Hey, I dropped 24 on 50% from three. Like, was I gonna like was someone gonna mention me? I, 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 I do 50% from downtown and you guys talk about Joe Harris. I don't get it. No, you're right though. And by the way, fourth quarter, when Kyrie was waning just from an energy standpoint, in spite of hitting that miracle three, this is what you needed, right? Hey, I can surge and carry this team and drop 12 in the third quarter, but someone's going to pick up the slack here and it ends up and has been more often than not Patty Mills. That's done the lift sure. on the injury side of it. Then when we talk about it, uh, 953 Mark LaMarcus Aldridge rolls his ankle. He goes out day to day with that day. Ron Sharp was out in this one due to uh, non COVID related illness, as those seem to be, have to be labeled these days. Um, when you look at this game again, you're completely shorthanded. You don't have anything, any, any, any expectation. You don't have James Harden in this one, which has to be frustrating. And when we went through the schedule and talked about, well, if you can kind of bat 500 in these non KD games, the assumption was you would have James Harden for most of them, especially the ones on the road with Kyrie. And, and clearly, you feel like you could have won this game if James Harden had been out there. Where do you stand as we approach this trade deadline now? Because there is this world where tied into the performances of guys tonight, LaMarcus Aldridge, Kessler Edwards, like I am starting to look at this roster and say, unless you have a real strong conviction about Nicholas Claxton and the role long-term for this team, Short term, it may just behoove you to utilize him in some capacity to get in another guy that can do things on the both ends of the floor consistently because it now it almost feels like a numbers game with the injuries of we may just need to make a move so we have enough talented players to win the games we feel like we automatically should, let alone some close contests against Golden State. Yeah, the stable's starting to look pretty darn empty here, and it's a really big concern that the Harden injury is just a new one because it's you haven't heard anything about the wrist at all. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, he's been dealing with a wrist problem. And it's like, oh, it turns out it's sprained or whatever it is. And he's can't, it's inflamed or whatever. And now he has to sit out. Like those are the things you always hate to hear. Late injury um, addition adds to it's just a totally new injury that you never heard about. I mean, no injuries are good. So whatever. But um, yeah, look, at some point you just don't have enough guys. And I don't know if I would advocate trading Claxton for roster depth um, now, because I still think that's probably too myopic of you. 
um, or mi microscopic of you, but the um, I do agree with the part where like you just don't have any guys to play anymore. Like NBA really ready, like re quality NBA talent. Um, yeah, like is just pretty few and far between. Like you needed a lot of minutes out of Blake. Like you needed uh, kind of just a lot of minutes out of James, more minutes out of James Johnson. You probably ever want to play him. Um, probably same with Bruce Brown at this point. And so, and that's only going to get worse now with, with Aldridge out. Cause like he played 15 and now you're not going to have him in the next game. Now maybe Dayron comes back, but yeah, I'm with you on the, at some point you just run out of players and yeah. like, I just don't, there's really no solution for that except to just tread water and hope that the guys come back. The problem is that none. I mean, that definitely the Aldridge thing looked like a sprain. I, you can't imagine he plays in the short term here. We already know the Harris is set back. We already have the timeline on Durant. Who knows what the thing with Harden is like, and the Nets are nothing if not absolutely terrible with telling you the timelines around injuries and then sticking to it. So you just can't trust that he's going to be back next game. Like the, no. I'll start trusting James Harden's back when he plays. Like I, I that's it. There's no other, yeah. that's it. I can't be like, Oh, hopefully, hopefully like they just don't do it that way. So I, there's this, that's fans aren't going to want to hear this, but there's just no solution. I don't think I would trade Claxton for just some random wing depth help or something, or, you know, any just guys to round out the roster. Cause just no, I mean, think I think that's you would do it. I don't know if you were suggesting that, but no, I, I think the willingness to put him into a package that gets you back maybe a slightly higher profile guy than some of these fringe things, whether it's buyout market guys or whatever package you're going to put together with Paul Millsap to move him, right? Like, obviously, Claxton is one of the more attractive young pieces on this roster. And if that could get you someone that you feel like plays significant minutes and starts to take over instead of this hodgepodge of 20 minutes from Dayron and Claxton and LMA, where all of a sudden you put someone into the four or five role and you go, you're, you're a 25, 30 minute guy. Right. And, and maybe who also provides you something different in terms of obviously the shooting ability, because that's obviously been the one drawback with how they're constructed right now. This role does not help you create additional spacing. I, even this game with Claxton, I know he's just getting back into the rhythm of things again, but it feels like we say that a lot with him just getting back into the rhythm. He, he has a hard time finishing around the rim. He's not exactly a monster on the defensive board. So there, there is this world where you go, Boy, if I just had a beefier rebound centric guy that maybe has any type of mid range shot in his game, that does open up a lot of things. So this is it's all about making the team a more effective playoff championship caliber team this year, not about jettisoning him for, you know, the ninth man on the bench. Well, does Paul Millsap know that there's probably minutes to play now? Like, well, I don't know. Like, I was about to say, you want to pull that back? Paulie, Paulie, Paulie. I know we said we'd be happy to work with you here, but we do, have you seen Blake out there? He is. We could use you for up. 15 here now. You want to play yourself into like a role where people want to trade for you? Like, come back and play 15 minutes now. I don't know. That's another very confusing situation that feels like it's been like that from the jump. So I don't really, I'm sure there's just probably nothing that can be done at this point about it. But I'm only highlighting that like they have other guys on the roster. Those guys, some of those guys just don't want to play. So, and, and let me just say too, I, I think maybe. The, you know, I, do I think maybe there's a move coming for the Nets? Yes. Do I think it's large scale? Probably not. Maybe it's just something on the fringe. The other thing is, I, I don't know how much you wanna, we want to like look into it this way. Of remember, they brought up David Duke Jr. to play some minutes for them out of the G League. Like they've been more than willing to go to their rookies and to go down to that G League. There's still another player down there, uh, the forward Raquan Gray, who they had drafted. You've seen a guy like Bryce Brown play a little bit down there. Like there are, there are thought they have Thon Maker, quite frankly, <laughs> down there too. Take like there Rousey. are these. There are like, these bodies where I think maybe the Nets' path forward in the short term is to say, well, we, we this is what we've been saying all year, kind of. We're in survival mode until everyone's healthy and we make our playoff run. And if that's the mindset that the Nets have, then maybe it is just this thing of pulling up bodies in, in the short term and seeing how it shakes out. This um is going to be a hard road. Like, I, I just like it's going to be a very interesting next whatever 10, 11. I don't, know, I don't know what today's date is. 11 days. It's going to be interesting to see if anything bubbles up, even on the short term. We know the TPEs, et cetera, but it feels like something has to shift a little bit here because you're going to lose Paul Millsap. James Johnson is such a up and down guy. Bruce Brown is out of rhythm. So if you think about it from that standpoint, the 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 depth is even shorter on this roster than it, than it is just with the injuries because other guys aren't even filling the roles that we anticipated. Yeah. And they, again, we talked about how like, this is just kind of, it's all bad when it comes to injuries. And this is one of the worst times to get it um, because this, this is a very, very tough stretch. They're running in uh Tuesday to a Phoenix team. That's an absolute juggernaut. 
the season, 39 and nine on the year, 7.9 point differential have made it look very easy. <laughs> like they've been remarkably healthy. They've had like no injuries on their team outside of like a Jake Crowder injury. And then Deandre eaton has been, I mean, I guess they lost Aiton for a period of time. Although it doesn't really matter with Chris Paul. Cause he makes any center that comes in and plays <laughs> look like Deandre Aiton. So I guess it doesn't matter, <laughs> but um, the, uh, yeah, this is just going to be really tough. So yeah, it's good that they have Kyrie for this point, but if you're just going to keep dropping bodies and this is, look, this is always the risk when you have, when you have a veteran heavy team or at least like a wide gap between your, you have a lot of veterans and a lot of rookies. Like that's how the team is made up. They have a lot of old guys and they have a lot of young guys. When you have a lot of old guys, you are just going to get hurt. Like this is just what happens. We see this is the Laker. Like LeBron's hurt now too. The the older you trend, the less those guys are going to be able to play because that's just the nature of age. And the Nets are just running into some of those problems now. Some of it's fluky injuries. You know, I get the KD injury was kind of fluky. Um, the Harris thing, like whatever, all just all, it's all fluky. And it can just happen to you more when you're older. <laughs> right. So yeah. like that's just and so like, I, you know, each individual injury, you wouldn't maybe ascribe to age. But at the same time, the older you get, the more injured you get. So it's just like that's just the, that part of the one to one graph is, is definitely real. So, yeah, this is a. Like we're in it now, man. I, I, I'm, I'm super bummed. They we'll get out of here now. But that, I'm super bummed yeah. they lost this game for that reason. Like at this point, winnable games kind of have to be won. And when they're not going to be won, this is like you just you dig yourself close to the danger point. And, and that's the reality of not just on the schedule of this is a bad team. We should be able to beat them. Then when you actually pull one out or think you can pull one out against a good team, that heightens it even more. So rough road trip still in the middle of it. Uh. Happy Monday, guys. I think that's probably the way you close this one out. That's why we, we started uh, with the Kyrie thing. We started yeah. positive to get you. We started we started the positive thing because there are still positives. Um, you just can't walk away mire. from that game feeling like all warm and fuzzy. Okay, we're going to get out of here. Uh, head on over to YouTube. Really appreciate it. As always, all the comments that have gone over there. People, you throw in comments too on Fridays. We're trying to do as many mailbags as possible. So you can throw questions in during the week comments. Sometimes we just take the comments, turn them into questions also. So make sure you're commenting over on the Locked On Nets YouTube channel. Subscribe. I will put the link in the show notes. Let's end with some humor, friends. Cat in the wall. Now you're talking my language. <laughs> Charlie Day. One of the all-time great poets. We'll be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.